welcome to EuroPCR 2023. My name is Mirvat Al Asnaj. I'm an interventional cardiologist practicing in Saudi Arabia. And with me is Ajay Curtinay, United States, Flavio Ribicchini, Italy, and we're here to discuss modern PCI. Well, hello, gentlemen. Hello, Mirvat. Modern PCI. In the cath lab, our armamentarium has grown tremendously in what we can offer our patients, diagnostic tools, but also therapeutic tools. But I think it's important to start off by talking about complex lesions and how modern PCI can help. How do we define complex PCI? Well, I would make a difference, Mirban, in between what is a complex patient and what is a complex lesion. We have to think on the patient first, and any complex patients will benefit of a modern concept which is small catheters, radial axis, very low radiation dose, very low contrast, and even if possible, contrastless physiology guidance. I would say think strut stents as short as possible, stent as big as possible. And on that, for instance, the association in between stents and drug coating balloons may help you to reduce the amount of metal. This is generally applies to complex patients. Complex lesions is anything that makes you work harder, especially bifurcations, total occlusions, and calcified lesions. In that case, you need very good diagnosis. And of course, we know fluoroscopy is not enough to plan the strategy. So intravascular imaging, probably physiology in case ideally wireless, and then of course optimal lesion preparation with all the devices that now we have in, in, in the shell that were not available many years ago. Ajay, I want to follow up on what Flavio said, that it really starts with the diagnostic tools that we have. Um, in terms of intracoronary imaging, can you shed a little bit of light on its role in complex lesions and how we should be doing it in the cath labs? For sure, and I totally agree with you. Your, the whole assessment of what's happened in this space is exciting. I think that people come to meetings like EuroPCR still because coronary really drives what we do. And it's not the same coronaries that we were treating when I was in training. This is very, very difficult disease to treat. Um, despite our best devices, the restenosis rates are higher. But there's good news, and the good news is that there's now data-driven evidence for intravascular imaging, for instance, in terms of reducing adverse events. Um, multiple sites have shown it. We're going to see more this year as well. Um, so I just feel that the way I guess I learned to do PCI has evolved, and that's what makes it exciting. So the use of imaging, I mean, you and I were involved with a document from the ACC's Interventional Council on the fact that we felt that for complex lesion subsets, things like left main, ISR, calcified lesions, uh, you really need to do imaging routinely in those types of cases. And the reason this for, has to be routine is that you can't just do them in the only complex cases because then you don't really know how to interpret and what you're looking at. Final point I'll make really quickly on imaging is that the way we learned imaging was on existing systems where you really couldn't see very well. And modern PCI systems that actually allow you to see, make the measurements easily, make length measurements because you've done an automated pullback, it really helps you take care of the patient more effectively in the cath lab, more efficiently too, and hopefully get a better outcome. Absolutely. And just again, um, you know, Flavio, we had a session here at EuroPCR where we went into the specifics of imaging in PCI and calcified lesions, actually. And it wasn't just to define the morphology of the lesion itself, but the re remainder of the vessel. It was important to examine it to identify appropriate landing zones, size, have a, d a reference size in order to stent those lesions, and then optimize. So after you've deployed your stent, is it adequately deployed? Are you satisfied with, with the expansion, apposition, edge dissections, and so on? And I, that was a full room and was pretty exciting is because we are all understanding the importance of imaging. And on this specific case, I'd like to make two comments. One is the need for training how to interpret what we see. Because it's easy to put a catheter and, and make the, 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 the retrieval, but the analysis is getting more and more important, whether it's a fracture, which is a nodule, which is superficial, which is deep, which is long. So we have to train on that, our young colleagues. And the other comment would be, uh, he said, I mean, my, my way of working has changed since I was, of course, I remember the only intravascular imaging I used to have in the beginning was the good old IVUS. Now you have much better images with OCT. But if we talk about complex patients, we have to remember that IVUS provides you the possibility of doing a PCI practically without giving contrast. Contrast is not good for the kidneys, it's not good for the patients. OCT is great, but 
it makes you use much more contrast media. So I still prefer IVUS because you can do a procedure practically contrastless and gives you a lot of information. I'd say more or less the same information you get. Probably you need more training to interpret these images, but it's very worth it that we learn how to use it. And just to kind of add to what you said, I mean, we do have now a development with enhanced imaging by fluoro that helps you see stents and so on, but it comes at a price of extra radiation to the operator. And that's something where something like intravascular ultrasound actually helps reduce your radiation Especially exposure. in long procedures, Absolutely. in long procedures like CTO or bifurcations. Another issue you have to have in mind, the good fluoroscopic devices we have now allow you to get very good images without doing cine. You can just use fluoro and store your images and you reduce the dose of the radiations by more than half. Yeah, and just to re-emphasize what you said, it's important to get comfortable with imaging well before you get into the difficult lesions. So if it becomes something you do on a routine basis for the simple and the complex, then you become more, um, I guess, facile with it. Um, as you go along. Yeah, absolutely. I think the other thing building on uh, what Flavio was saying is the, the HD systems also afford a much clearer view of what's going on. And you mentioned really uh, briefly about fracture and calcium. And I think that that's so essential to make sure that we're adequately prepping the lesion because part of it is seeing but exactly the point you made. Just because you pull the IVUS catheter doesn't mean you're going to change the outcome. You have to act appropriately on those findings and whether that involves adjunctive um, balloon technologies, whether it involves atherectomy when needed, and then re-imaging to be sure that you've actually done what you can do to expand the stent adequately. That's kind of my workflow now. Um, and many people say, well, you, you all are doing too much. but. I can't think of doing it any other way because I really want to know exactly what I'm treating, that I've done a good job, and that the patient's going to have a good outcome. So this is a good segue to a little more focused uh, discussion on calcium management. We're seeing more patients with calcification in the cath lab. So what are the options and how do you choose between the tools? Well, it's, it's very nice to see the interest that in the last, I'd say, five, six years have grown from a niche treatment where you only had rotablation and very old experts using a difficult to use, per se, difficult to use device. And now we are realizing that this is everyday life because patients are older, patients are more complex. We live longer, so we get calcified at a certain point. So now it's routine practice. And so I think that you need to train and you need to have a well um, and say full of devices, full of devices options in your shell. And then you, you, you need high pressure balloons, you need cutting balloons, which is very effective. Of course, the good old rota, which is by far my preferred, but then of course the overwhelming efficacy of lithotripsy that gives you, I think this gives you the full array of opportunities of treating vessels. I think we have reached the, the, the top technology we need to tackle these complex calcified lesions. Another technology that perhaps comes after plaque modification is drug-coated balloons. And I'm actually going to direct this to you, Ajay, because I know you work in the U.S. and they're not, they still haven't been FDA approved to use drug-coated balloons. Um, but they are a promising technology. So where do you see um, this heading? Yeah, it's good asking the U.S. person about drug-coated balloons because we can only wish. But um, the reality is, is that they're going to be coming soon, we hope. Um, you know, we've completed enrollment in Agent IDE, which is an ISR-based study. We hope to be able to present that at the ACC next year. And the idea of that study is to do drug colored balloon versus POBA for ISR because there's a, there's a desire to avoid putting in metal when you don't have to. Obviously, their stents are amazing and you want to use them when you need to, but you don't always have to put them in. And what I've been really in encouraged by at EuroPCR, especially this year, is there's this whole resurgence of thought on maybe we're putting too many stents in, maybe we can stent a little bit less and use these other technologies with imaging guidance, even physiologic guidance, to our advantage. Antonio Colombo wrote a really provocative editorial in the European Heart Journal that he talked about this. And I remember when Antonio, when I was a fellow, Antonio was stenting, you know, stem to stern, full skeleton metal jackets yes. of how things went. And now he's saying the absolute opposite. But that's what makes our field exciting. So I think there's a lot on the horizon with drug-coated balloons. I'm glad that we were able to complete enrollment in this trial. Um, and there's certainly other trials starting up as well. So very quickly, Flavio, how are you fitting drug-coated balloons into your practice? Well, I, I am lucky. Uh, unlike him, I, I, I have been using it for nearly 15 years since the beginning. My first indication was the treatment of instant restenosis. And again, the need of having a look inside the stent to understand the mechanism of stent fracture is very important. So it's 
I was guided instant restenosis and DCB. And then, of course, we have also a good experience in diffuse disease. Not necessarily small vessels, but diffuse disease. My aim, and this is from long time I have understood that, the less metal is better for the patient. So this possibility of reducing the stent length is, uh, is very important for the long term. I agree. The and just to kind of follow up on the less metal bifurcations as well. So if we want to go with a, bif with a provisional strategy, perhaps the side branch can be treated with a drug-coated balloon as an option. So thank you, gentlemen. We went through diagnostic tools to actual treatment in the cath lab, in a modern cath lab for complex lesions. And to our viewers, thank you for tuning in.